Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Nerdy Talk. I am RT Omni, of course, and boy has it been way too long since the first episode of this series. Uh, if you guys remember, back in October I put out a video about my first impressions of the Switch, and I said in that video that I wanted to make a video about the actual hardware design for the Switch, and that's something that I asked you guys about on Twitter, and you said, you should talk about the design, and I said, yeah, I'll do that, but... Obviously, I haven't had the time between the first episode and this one, so I thought now would be a good time to finally do that, just because the big Nintendo Switch press event is upon us, and I thought, you know, if I don't do this now, my ideas are, and thoughts are going to be rendered obsolete, so uh, I, I wanted to put this out now before it's too late, and uh, it's also a nice time to do it because right now is when all of the the rumors and ideas and speculations have sort of come to an like an apex. You know, we've we've had more information since the reveal. We've had some patents come out about the Switch, and who knows how much of that's actually going to be manifested in the actual product, the actual final design. But it gives us a better idea of what we can expect. And we also had that Switch demonstration on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. So I feel like we have more information to work with now to talk about this particular subject. And so I think we're in a little bit of a golden opportunity. But yeah, I feel like this has to be done. I've had these ideas in my head for too long, so I'm just making it now. But before I continue, I do want to mention that this this kind of, you know, speculative content, it's it's not really what I wanted to focus on with with Nerdy Talk as a series. Just because, like I mentioned, this sort of content sort of it sort of has an expiration date, like after after the subject matter gets talked about and speculated upon, then the real information comes out, and suddenly that video is just sitting there on your channel, and anybody who watches that video, you know, everything you say, you basically sound ignorant, because that, that sort of ephemeral content, it doesn't really last beyond the point of the actual reveal of the information. So I don't really want to make this series about, you know, following news cycles, because that content is, you know, it's very time-sensitive. But I think we're in a unique position right now just because, you know, we don't really get an opportunity to speculate on a console, especially as a Nintendo enthusiast. A Nintendo console is very, very special, a new console. So I feel like I'm going to make an exception to that uh, for this particular time of our lives. What a world we live in, you know? Uh, but yeah, let's just jump right into it. So you, you guys wanted me to talk about visual hardware design and my thoughts on the Switch. So let's talk about the overall outward appearance of the console and uh, how it just looks, how the aesthetics work. And uh, for me, I think I'm pretty happy with it. I like the way it looks. It definitely feels a lot more premium than the Wii U gamepad did. I'm looking at it just sitting on my floor right now for some reason. But uh, yeah, it definitely feels less like a Fisher Price toy, as a lot of people like to say. And obviously, it's no Apple product. I mean, Apple makes probably the best looking hardware on the market. And the Switch probably isn't going to win any awards for excellence in modern product design or anything like that. But that being said, it does look pretty nice. And it looks a lot more, I guess, uh, luxurious, if you could say that, than the Wii U did. So points for that. But I do wonder if if the Switch can survive a fall from you know an average person's standing height, like five feet, six feet up. Obviously, you don't hold it up to your head. But... Uh, it c could a uh, switch survive a fall if it was dropped at a diagonal with the Joy-Con hitting the floor, you know? Because those tracks that attach the Joy-Con to the main screen unit, they need to be really sturdy. Otherwise, you know, it could break. And with Nintendo, we've had a good track record of of products and and hardware that survives pretty well. It's pretty rugged. But I think this is probably the sleekest looking Nintendo hardware we've had. So, that's always a challenge when it comes to making something both strong and sleek. And uh, when you think of things like, you know, whatever it was, the iPhone 6, I think it was, when they started saying, oh, you can bend an iPhone. And obviously, Nintendo has a better track record, or a pretty good track record, I shouldn't say better, but a good track record of making really sturdy hardware. Like, if you think about a 3DS, I mean, that thing can survive a fall, and so could the DS. But the Switch is, uh, it's a home console also. It's not just a handheld, and that means the hardware is more expensive. And so this is... It's not quite the same case as the 3DS. One, they're trying to make it appeal more to a, an older demographic, so they need to make it look nice and sexy and all that. But also, it's a, 
probably going to be $250 or maybe even more, $300, $350, who knows? We won't know until a few days from now, but it's it's a bit more of an investment. And if you drop that and the track breaks on the Joy-Con, you know, what are you going to do? So we'll see if Nintendo keeps to their reputation, but uh, I have pretty high hopes. But moving on, a lot of people are a little bit unhappy about the dual color gray on black sort of color scheme. And I think I think it looks fine. A point that somebody made in another video that I watched recently, I can't remember who it was. I would give them a shout out if I could. But something that they said that I agree with is that the Joy-Cons being a different color emphasizes the, the actual nature of the product itself. Because the Joy-Cons can be detached from the unit and attached to the Joy-Con grip and all that. And them being a different color kind of just emphasizes that point. And so I think that's a good sort of narrative that they're kind of telling with the visual design. It can be detached and configured in a number of different ways for, you know, different play styles. So I'm always a big fan of that sort of, uh, I guess I guess you could call it symbolism in, in visual design. So I have no problem with the, the two-color color scheme. And it also seems like there might be color choices down the line for those Joy-Cons, especially if you can buy the Joy-Cons separately. So we'll see. I mean, there's some opportunities there for people to kind of personalize their own Switch because this is a handheld platform. And part of that is just showing off your personality and your individuality through the things that you purchase. And so color choices, I think, is a good way to go. And the Joy-Cons being the medium through which those choices can be made seems like a good idea to me. So I'm all for it. But I think that pretty much that's all, that's all I have on visual design. Uh, contrary to my profession, I don't actually care all that much about what the Switch looks like. I really I care more about how it plays and how well it fulfills its purpose as an actual gaming device. So let's talk about controller input for a sec. So the Switch has all of your standard controller inputs. All of those seem to be present. So you've got those two shoulder buttons, the two triggers. You have four face buttons on the right, and you've got two analog sticks, and you've got a D-pad. Although, in the case of particularly the left Joy-Con, the idea of a D-pad kind of gets a little bit nebulous. But but I'll get I'll get into that later. But it's nice to know that if developers want to create games with, you know, standard tried and true uh, control schemes, they have the necessary inputs to do that. So that's a good sign. Third-party support's going to rely on Nintendo making sure that there's a good lineup out the gate, but we're not going to talk about launch lineup and stuff like that. But I do want to touch on a specific point, which the title of this episode alludes to, and that is the Joy-Cons. And uh, before the Switch reveal, um, I was actually a pretty vocal detractor against the idea of using the two sides of a controller, the two halves, basically, as individual controllers. So basically, I was against the idea of the horizontal Joy-Con, and I'll get into the points or the reasons for that, but before I do that, I do want to reiterate that I am pretty happy with the overall direction in which the Nintendo Switch is going, and this is just me expressing my concerns about uh, some of the finer points, basically, of the hardware design and what, what implications those have for games that that'll be created for the platform. So don't take this as me hating on the Switch or anything like that. I'm I'm a fan of the direction, but this I feel like these are concerns that do need to be addressed by Nintendo, and we'll see if they do address them in the press event. If they don't, then we'll just have to wait and see, and maybe the Treehouse will talk about some of the, some of the things that I'm going to be talking about here. But starting out, so the Switch gives you the option of taking the left and right Joy-Cons off of the main unit and using them as two separate controllers for two players to use. And obviously that means you're holding the Joy-Cons horizontally. Now the problem arises when you when you come to the realization that all of those inputs on the standard two Joy-Con grip setup, all of those inputs are concentrated to the top of the Joy-Cons when you're holding them vertically. And the obvious reason for that is that's the natural position for your thumb when you're gripping one of those halves. But when you turn it horizontally, suddenly you have this weird situation where for the left and right Joy-Con, those buttons are offset to either the left or the right side, depending on which one you have, and that presents a little bit of asynchronicity between the two players. And that's one of the things that actually had me thinking that 
before we actually saw the Switch reveal, I was thinking that the Eurogamer rumor where you could have the two Joy-Cons separated and use them as two separate controllers, I thought that was a terrible idea because that that those two inputs on each side are so close to the top, and so it would just be weird to hold them horizontally, but apparently Nintendo doesn't have that concern, or maybe they just thought it was acceptable. But that's one of the reasons why my, my NX mock-up, whatever you want to call it, that's the reason I, I said specifically, I don't think there's going to there's gonna be a situation where you're going to be able to hold those horizontally and use them. Plus, when you have those the analog sticks and the face buttons so close together, I have to imagine that your thumbs might actually collide with each other if you're holding the, the analog stick towards the face buttons and you're trying to press the face button closest to the stick. People with big thumbs are not going to be able to use those very comfortably, I don't think. So there's already some ergonomics concerns there. Uh, but we'll see how it works out in practice. I don't really quite know the scale of the unit, so maybe it will be just good enough. And Nintendo, they, they care a lot about ergonomics. I mean, you can tell when when they made the changes to the gamepad from having those circle pads directly on top of the face button, they actually offset those diagonally. And the main reason for that is because your thumb pivots that way. That's how your thumb naturally goes. From the stick to the face buttons, it's a diagonal to the side. It's not just straight down. So ergonomics overall, I'm a little bit concerned about the Joy-Cons. Another big concern I have when it comes to particularly the left Joy-Con is that we don't have a traditional D-pad anymore. What we have is four additional face buttons that are configured with, you know, D-pad arrows on them. And obviously that's because they wanted to have the option to use that Joy-Con by itself as its own standalone controller. And that's another reason that I thought the idea from the Eurogamer rumor was silly. Because without a traditional D-pad, it presents a dilemma that isn't usually there. With a standard D-pad, there's a pivot so that you can't press left and right simultaneously. It's not like a computer where you have the arrow keys, and you can press all four arrow keys on a computer at the same time. So so now games have to account for the situations where you have, you're accidentally pressing up and down at the same time, or left and right, or all four, because frankly, your thumb can hover over all four buttons and press them all down simultaneously. So how are they going to handle that when it comes to actual button mapping? That's going to be a little bit weird. It'll probably be fine, but I do want to bring it up because I think it does present some complication that otherwise wouldn't be there if they just stuck to their regular d-pad and obviously there's going to be the pro controller and that has a regular d-pad so if you really care about that precision and having that feel right because i i really love the feel of a of a traditional nintendo d-pad um there's going to be the, the pro controller so it's not a huge concern and i'll probably use the pro controller more often than anything else but uh, again this is this is why I feel like the Joy-Cons aren't going to be like quite up to snuff when it comes to all of the necessary comforts of a controller. Now, the final point that I want to touch on regarding the Joy-Cons is something that I actually talked a little bit about in the last video, and that is designing for Joy-Con multiplayer. Now, obviously, they've already had this sort of design challenge before with the horizontal Wii Remote, and so they've had instances where Games are designed to use just the one and two buttons in conjunction with just the D-pad and maybe the A button for special occasions. Uh, I don't think most games, if any, used the B button, except for maybe Smash, when you're holding the Wii Remote sideways. So they've already dealt with this, and they have a little bit more to work with with the Joy-Cons. They have presumably two shoulder buttons hidden in the area that goes into the track when the Joy-Cons are attached. So I've heard things about there be, being two shoulder buttons there on the top flat section of the Joy-Con, and it seems to be logical. I mean, when you watch video footage of people playing with the Joy-Con, their fingers are sort of positioned in such a way that they anticipate pressing something down there. So we'll just assume for now that they do have two shoulder buttons. That gives them four face buttons, which is already two more than they had. And rather than a D-pad, they have an analog stick, which does present some new opportunities that weren't there otherwise. But I do feel like I'll probably miss having a D-pad on a single Joy-Con because I like playing stuff like New Super Mario Brothers with a D-pad rather than an analog stick, and I might be in the minority for that, but it just feels more appropriate for sort of that classic gameplay to have a D-pad rather than, a, than an analog stick there. But that's not really a huge deal, I would say. So, oh, one last point that I wanted to make. So that was not actually my final point. This is my final point. Uh, how are they going to communicate 
what button to press during gameplay. And what I mean is like, how are they going to use UI prompts? Because typically you just have a thing like in dialogue, like if you think of Super Mario, they just stick the A button as a little graphic in line with the text. So just press A or go left on the analog stick. But when you have the four face buttons on the Joy-Con and then you take them and turn them 90 degrees for the horizontal layout, suddenly what is usually A button on the right, B button on the bottom, X on the top and Y on the left, all of that is flipped over. So now you're dealing with, what is it? A on the bottom, B on the left, Y on the top and X on the right. And that's super confusing to me. So what are they going to do? Also, the left Joy-Con doesn't even have lettered buttons on it. It's just arrows. So I guess what they're going to have to do is just say, of the four buttons in this diamond configuration, press the one on the bottom and they can use an icon like, um, I'll put it on the screen. They can just like light it up. And I think they kind of allude to this in the way they formatted the Breath of the Wild button layout when they tell you to press certain things. Like they always show all four buttons and then say, press this one, which says A here, but in another game it could say nothing. It could just be a circle. So maybe they're just going to use an icon that shows all four face buttons and you and use that in line with the text. I don't know. That's the best solution I could come up with and it's probably perfectly serviceable. Um, but I don't know. Overall, with when it comes to the Joy-Cons, I'm a little bit reserved on how it'll all come together, but I'm pretty confident, or at least cautiously optimistic, about Nintendo's ability to really utilize those control options well. And I imagine third parties will probably struggle a little bit, like they always do when it comes to utilizing Nintendo's kind of weird uh, control setups, but... I usually only play Nintendo's uh, actual in-house developed games. So uh, I, I probably won't have any problems personally. <laughs> so it's a little bit weird that I'm voicing all of these, you know, criticisms about the Joy-Con's design. But overall, I am still pretty happy with where the Switch is going. They still have the Pro Controller, and I'll probably use that, like I said, more often than anything. Actually, really quick, let's talk about the Pro Controller because... Uh, I actually really like the way the Pro Controller looks. I don't know how other people feel about it, but I think it's a little bit visually striking, particularly because if you look at images of the Pro Controller from the reveal trailer and from some of the promotional images that they put out, it has this interesting kind of striking design uh, element where the front plate looks like it's translucent. It looks kind of like back when they did stuff on the N64 where you could see the inside of the controller and see the inside of the main unit. It looks like they're doing that kind of thing because you can see these weird patterns, like like these weird sort of faded plus signs sort of all strewn about on the front plate. And that looks like the kind of reinforcement points that they'd have as part of the actual plastic plate so that you can't like squish the plate down. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I like the look. I think it's it's unique in a time where all of these other hardware manufacturers are kind of trying to go with this really sleek, modern, um, anodized aluminum and things like that. Not to say that the Pro Controller for the Switch isn't super sleek, but it it kind of has its own identity in that respect, and I think that's cool. Anywho, it seems like we're going to be in for a really, really enjoyable console, and in a few days we're going to know so much more about games, and I wish I could have covered my thoughts on games that we saw in the reveal trailer. But I mean, what else is there to say about all of that? Like Splatoon 2, I mean, I'm sticking with the idea that it is actually a sequel and not just an enhanced port of Splatoon from the Wii U. Uh, but I, I don't want to get into that right now. But that's pretty much all I've got for this video. So it might be a little bit shorter than you might have wanted. I know I talked about in the comments of the last video, I talked about wanting to do like longer form stuff when it comes to stuff that's just voice only. And I wish I could right now, but um, for now, this is just going to have to do. But I hope you guys enjoyed it. You might notice that this video might not feel as tight or concise as the first episode. And the reason for that, I actually spent like way too long on that first video trying to make it like super perfect. And I did a lot of different takes for all of the points that I wanted to cover. But it probably came off a little bit scripted. I don't know. But I just came to this realization that I'm just not going to be able to put out these kinds of videos with with any amount of consistency if uh, yeah i'm like a perfectionist about it and I'm, I'm a perfectionist about everything 
So from now on, these, these videos are probably going to be a little bit looser and I'm probably going to record them mostly in like a single take, maybe recording some lines over in like twice or something like that. I don't know, but I hope that's okay with you guys. Uh, I figure that less precise, but more frequent content is better than content that's like really well edited down, but then you go months and months without a single upload. So, uh, I'm trying to achieve that balance and hopefully uh, I can continue to do these and I don't know what the next one's going to be about. So if you're going to, if you want to leave a comment suggesting what I talk about, I do have some other ideas actually, but I don't know when I'm going to talk about them, but that's it guys. So uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments, uh, like subscribe, all that end of video nonsense. And I will see you guys in the next nerdy talk. But until then, you'll probably see me streaming quite a bit more. I already did two streams in two days, so I was pretty proud of myself there. Already a better track record than last year, right? Uh, so, until next time, I've been Artsy Omni, and I'll see you guys later. Bye.